Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our uh, Rethinking Iran uh, event for today, the book forum, um, which we're very honored to have Professor Pamela Academy here with us. I'm sorry we were having some technical difficulties in the beginning. Um, I hope everyone can see us now. Um, and before I get started, I also just want to apologize. I um, am getting over a flu, so I have um, I might start coughing in the middle, but uh, I hope everyone is doing okay and staying healthy wherever you might be. Um, so I'm Nagas Bajofi. I'm an assistant professor here at SAIS Johns Hopkins Rethinking Iran and one of the co-directors of the Rethinking Iran Initiative. Um, we are very excited to have with us today Professor Pamela Kadimi uh, to talk about her new really incredible book, Alternative Iran. Um, professor Pamela Kadimi is an architect and architectural historian. She earned her PhD from the History, Theory, and Criticism of Art and Architectural Program at MIT in 2009. She's currently a professor in the Art History Faculty at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. She's the author of many books and publications, um, including the really excellent book we will be discussing with her today, Alternative Iran, Contemporary Art and Critical Spatial Practice, which was just published by Stanford University Press in 2022. Um, the book was awarded the Miller Niece, I hope I'm saying that right, Publication Fund from the College Art Association and a publication grant from the Graham Foundation and Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, which means that when you actually hold the book in your hand, you'll see that it has really incredible um, colored photographs and prints of a lot of the art that um, Professor Academy actually um, talks about in her book. So it makes the book a really um, pleasurable experience, not just sort of reading through it, but also seeing all the art in it. Um, so first of all, welcome, Pamela. Um, it's really wonderful to have you here with us today. Thank you very much, Nargis. It's, it's truly an honor uh, to, uh, to participating in this panel and to be in conversation with you. Um, so I want to um, to get started. You start the book really sort of provocatively in this beautiful manner where um, you take us to, um, you, you start personally and you go to where um, you yourself had been taking classes in art history in the post-revolutionary period in Iran in a um, you sort of, you, you map it out for us how you have to go to your uh, teachers, your professors uh, class that is not publicly known. People only know about it through word of mouth. And then in the middle of some of some times in the middle of these classes, um, the air raids will go off because it's during the Iran Iraq war. It's the latter half of it where the cities are getting bombed in Iran. And you literally are in an underground quote unquote class and have to then go underground itself to seek protection from uh, from the the war and and the potential bombing that's that would take place in the cities and so I I wanted to kind of get us started there because you you spatially put us in an underground and then you also use that to really complicate this notion of what an underground means in Iran in the post revolutionary sphere especially in relation to the arts and and um, the artistic world more broadly. Um, and then um, it's a, I'll start there because I, I really love how you did that. And, and so I want I want you to sort of get, take us there itself and, and how, why you started us there and what that allows you to do and sort of opening up from the underground and getting to this sense of an alternative Iran. Well, thank you so much, Nargis, for um, starting with that question, which I love the personal uh, kind of narrative uh, that I chose to place in the very beginning of the book. Um, you know, Nargis, for a long time um, since I came to the United States, and I've been here for near 25 years now, uh, there's always this question in the air about the Iranian art scenes and that a lot of them take place in the underground. So for me, as someone who has training in architecture, underground was always a very curious subject 
uh, not just because I know that a lot of publications are produced in the underground and we call them the underground because they're not published by uh, uh, by official uh, uh, publishers and presses, uh, but I was interested in the topic in a spatial terms, um, especially after uh, after reading books like reading Lolita in Tehran and also watching films like No One Knows About Persian Cats by Bahman Gobadi, I became more and more fascinated in, in the spatial aspects of, uh, of the underground. How does somebody's personal apartment or personal house becomes an underground for reading literature that is not, not allowed in the university con uh, context? How does somebody's basement becomes a place for a rock music band um, that is not um, allowed to perform in official music venues? So I became interested in the topic spatially because of my training in architecture, but also because of my own experience growing up in Iran. And I think that a lot of the things that happened in Iran had this spatial dimension to them. The class that I attended was one of the very uh, many studios that popped up like mushrooms, um, especially in Tehran after the Islamic Revolution. A lot of the artists who taught in these studios, the so-called private studios, uh, were actually um, uh, professors who were fired from their official jobs at the university. So they had no other choice but to create a, a private business for themselves. So many of them actually created uh, this business inside their domestic homes, inside their residential areas. Uh, but this one teacher of mine, uh, uh, who, who I, I really uh, uh, cherish and admire, and I'm still in touch with him, Mr. Ali Faroumarzi, he taught us painting um, inside, um, uh, you know, a, a, a business um, space, which he called the Studio Ali Faroumarzi, Studio Ali Faroumarzi. So it was not an unofficial place. It was registered. I'm sure he paid taxes and he was, he was just uh, conforming to the laws of the Islamic Republic. In other words, there was nothing illegal going on there, except for the fact that he probably basically did not promote it as um, as um, as as a public art classroom in which um, girls and boys could attend and could learn uh, both painting and also uh, uh, the history of painting that he taught us so generously. Um, so the book starts with that because I want to make it clear to um, to our readers from the get go that the story of these um, uh, spatial circumstances or the underground is not necessarily that black and white in Iran. And so um, it's not like something is hidden or something illegal is happening, like everybody's sitting down and portraying a nude a woman or things like that. No, it wasn't at all something like that, but it was more complicated than that. And that's why I started with the story of Ali Faramarzi's studio. And then in the rest of the book, what I try to do is try to convince, actually, I should say in the rest of the introduction, is try to convince my reader what I mean by alternative and why did I, cho did I choose the word alternative as opposed to underground? Because our understanding of underground is something that is completely illegal from the standpoint of the government and that is completely hidden from sight. But a lot of these places were not uh, were not uh, designed or operated as such, and I wanted to clarify it for our um, readers. So um, in your book, which I also really appreciated because of the, the, the prose and the way that you wrote it, I mean, it, it's both, um, it's very layered, but it, you write it in such a clear manner. Um, and you also, you know, bring in the, the personal narratives at times, but uh, then the, the stories of the many artists that you end up interviewing, as well as those sort of more broadly in the art world in Iran. And in there, as you're talking about why you chose alternative as opposed to underground, you have a really fascinating discussion about how some artists themselves will refer to something as underground, even though they may even have permission for it, as you're saying, um, or uh, some will say, well, I don't like that this was being called underground. It's much more experimental. Um, so it's very much you, you, you depict to us how 
that terminology and that concept in and of itself is a live concept in Iran. And it's something that there's a lot of debate over. Um, and possibly, I don't know, but possibly because of that debate, what alternative does for you is allow you to get out of the confines of that debate that has been sort of um, marked in specific ways and with specific kinds of politics for such a long time. So can you can you tell us, you know, for you, what alternative does and, and what it then allows you to explore uh, in these past 30 years that you sort of end up going through in, in your book about the, the, the art world in Iran? Yes. Um, uh, so, Nargis, the, this idea of the alternative as opposed to the underground allowed me to look more broadly at the art scenes in Iran. A lot of the things that we take for granted, we, we look at the images of what comes out of Iran, like a performance that takes place in an underground thermal bath. And we immediately think that it's happening inside an unknown place. And, the, and it's definitely underground. And that's uh, that's basically the picture that uh, that animates the cover of this book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, this this uh, art that seems to be underground and secretive actually does receive permission from the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance. In my conversation, uh, conversations with a lot of artists in Iran, I noticed that most of the time, most of the time, and by that I mean perhaps 90% of the time, they do get permission from the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance. But then it's in the negotiations that they have with the officers at the ministry that they come up with creative ways to uh, convince them that their art has uh, no problematic aspects to it from the point of view of the Islamic Republic. Uh, uh, and then and then and then they intentionally decide to go and perform this art in places that are um, that are away from the center. Right. So they prefer to go vertically underground because it gives them some sort of psychological uh, uh, freedom uh, to express their artistic ideas better. Uh, or they depart from the center, which is Tehran. So they go and they move their art um, uh, in the middle of a desert or in the middle of a forest in the north. And that also gives them the opportunity to have more freedom, to have more interactions, and to be more creative. Also, the term alternative allowed me to look at the underground, not in terms of going vertically down, but also going horizontally away from the center. It allowed me to think about the notion of time. So it's not all about the space. It's also about time and ephemerality. And I studied a lot of artworks that are done in public spaces, in visible public spaces in the city of Tehran. But then because of their short time span, they continue to survive and they continue to operate in the city. So um, time-wise, it also allowed me to be a little bit more creative in terms of thinking about uh, a lot of um, dissident art forms, if you will, or protest or subtly protest art, art forms that are being produced in Iran. Um, and I also, you know, use, as, as you've seen in the book, I use a lot of theoretical ideas in the book, but Michel de Certeau, Henri Lefebvre, even, even uh, um, theories of jazz, jazz music that have come into the fields of anthropology and other fields uh, so that we can look at the notion of improvisation and how it works in different concepts. So, for example, when it came to curators, I was very, very interested in how they improvised and negotiated the way uh, um, uh, so that they could have a thought provoking exhibition uh, while also having the permission from the Ministry of Culture in hand. Um, so the I want I want us to get to um, the context of of the you know the backdrop of the political backdrop against which the artists are working in, um, 
So in the post-revolutionary period, there, the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance comes about. And this is something that all artists um, and writers and others must sort of contend with in order to get their work out in Iran, as well as gallery spaces and, and museums and whatnot. Um, so I want you to talk about that. But I also, what I love about it is that in your book, you show the the very real contestations and the fact that, as you said, actually earlier in this conversation as well, artists will, um, or teachers or, or who, whoever it is that you're talking about will get the permission oftentimes, but then there's a longer process of negotiation. And there are a lot of instances in which in the end, the artists just pull out and say, I, I'm done, I'm not doing this anymore. And that in and of itself, lives on it sort of has an afterlife to the art um and one of the the ones that i love that you brought up is uh puya Aryampur's um uh his um mirror work on uh the beautiful virgin and how that was first sort of covered and then you know it, it sort of goes into all of these iterations and those of us who have either looked at or studied iran know we can imagine a lot of this stuff because we see it a lot um, so can you talk about the, those contestations that you write about in this book between the artists and the art world and the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance and the different iterations that that has gone through throughout these decades that you've looked at in the book? Because it's, it, the, that also has had its ups and downs as you write about. Absolutely. So, you know, the Islamic Republic has, has not been a, uh, a coherent it hasn't been as coherent as we all think uh, in the past 43 years, depending on who is in the ministry, who's um, in the ministry, who these officers are, who is um, uh, uh, the president uh, of the republic, uh, the degrees of freedom that are given to the artists um, um, actually vary a lot. Um, and so we have to be aware of that in terms of the nuances of these negotiations and improvisations. So sometimes, for example, during Khatami, artists had a little bit more freedom to do uh, a, 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 a very provocative kind of exhibition and to organize a provocative performance. Um, however, um, as we all know, uh, when uh, President Raisi took office, he appointed a new minister of Islamic uh, of, of for the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance. His name is Muhammad uh, Mehdi Ismaili. Um, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, he's he's he he has some trainings in in religious um, issues um, and, and in theology, but not so much in art. And uh, when he came to power, he produced an 80 page long um, uh, document, uh, which he called uh, Barname or program, the new program for the ministry. And uh, uh, when you read the pages of this program, uh, you'll notice that they have highlighted a lot of problems, a lot of pro problems that exist uh, in the art scenes of Iran. And they have it in all categories, from music to performance art, to theater, to fashion design, and so on and so forth. And uh, they highlight a lot of problems uh, that most exhibitions are places of anti-revolutionary ideas, uh, that they have been contaminated uh, because a lot of Western artists and musicians have been invited to these scenes and the story goes on. And this is a moment, the August of tw uh, 2021, that we see that artist community um, actually responds very, very forcefully uh, to the ministry and um, they get very agitated by this new description and this new approach of the ministry. And this is when, um, you know, a lot of artists actually say from now on, we are not going through the pain of getting the permission from the Islamic Republic and we are going to do it in other ways. Basically, they mean we're going to go underground completely. And uh, we don't need to even talk with you, to even negotiate with you. Um, so yes, there are a lot of different stories, as you aptly mentioned, Nargis. Um, and there are all, uh, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of narratives on how curators and artists actually found a way to perform their arts. And that's why, um, 
I decided to include a lot of different voices in this book, now I guess, as you know, because, you know, some other authors may have chosen to just focus on four or five artists and then get really into the depth of what they do, cover the body of their artwork uh, as it has been produced uh, since they became a professional artist and so on and so forth. But my goal in this book was to introduce a movement, something that has always existed in Iran, but unfortunately, unfortunately, nobody has uh, has has documented it all in one place. And so that's why I talk a lot. Of, I talk a lot about different voices from curators to architects who collaborate with artists to theater experts and to um, uh, to musicians. Uh, I know this is a large kind of uh, a, a kind of a body of work to cover in one book, and probably that's one of the reasons why the book uh, got uh, a little bit thick. Uh, but my goal was not to provide a history of theater under the Islamic Republic or a history of painting or installation art under the Islamic Republic. The goal was to show a movement that takes place spatially. And as you know, and you have read the book, theories of space, most of which were created in the 1960s um, uh, by uh, the French um, critical theoreticians like Michel de Certeau and Henri Lefebvre, these are very, very prominent throughout the book. And the application of these theories to the artworks that I discuss is also not arbitrary. Iranian artists themselves are very aware of these theories. Uh, just as a comparison, these books by these uh, French critical um, theoreticians have been uh, translated much more than books on theories of the environment, let's say, works by Bruno Latour. Um, so that's why I, I decided to focus on things that matter most to Iranians. And in every case, I came across this overlap of a desire to play this cat and mouse game along spatial structures rather than just creating a two-dimensional painting and put it on the wall. So this, um, you know, the, I mean, not only is, is the word spatial in, in the title of the, in the subtitle of the book, but also it's very, uh, you know, as someone who, like as an anthropologist reading this, the way that you deal with space was really um, um, provocative for me to think about. Um, and I know that you're trained as an arch architect and as an architectural historian. So I wanted to ask you how you, you know, how that training came to inform the analysis and the writing of this book. Because as you're saying, before before I opened the book, I thought I was going to be reading something very different than what I read. Um, I thought it was going to be a little bit more as what you were saying in your previous answer, more like a traditional art historian text about. Uh, different art forms in, in post-revolutionary Iran. But as you're saying, that's not what this book is. It's actually uh, very attuned to um, the various kinds of artistic movements in Iran and the ways in which there's been this, you know, it's, it's a live text, I think in the best way, because it shows the ways in which these are always, all of the concepts you're talking about in the book, all of the things that you're showing us in the book are very uh, live in the sense that people are constantly um, debating them in society. They are constantly um, uh, sort of um, going back and forth, whether with the state and getting permission or uh, in, in thinking about ways of creating, for example, participatory theater or whatever it might be in relation to uh, whatever the current political moments and social moments in Iran is. Um, so how, how did your own training in architecture and come to play into how you conceived of this book and how you sort of thought about how, you know, the, the analysis that brought it all together? Absolutely. Yes, Nargis, you're absolutely right that as an architect, as someone uh, who has uh, her training first and foremost in in architecture i i've always been fascinated by the ways in which architecture accommodates art 
and how artists actually interact uh, with the city, the space of the gallery and the museum in which uh, uh, they present their art. Um, I received my architectural education in the 1990s in Iran. Um, and I was the student of people like Manu Chehra Mozayani, who uh, translated uh, uh, Jeffrey Broadbent's uh, book, um, uh, Deconstruction into Farsi, uh, just a few years after it was published, and he named it Vasazi. He even invented a word for deconstruction, which is Vasazi. And uh, these kind of structuralist and deconstructivist ideas um, emerged in the architecture scenes of the 1990s. Bernard Chumi um, uh, famously uh, talked about and wrote about and, and practiced his design uh, through a concept which he calls principles of reciprocity. He looked at choreography and the relationship between human body and space. Uh, Peter Eisenman did the same. He, in fact, collaborated with Bernard Chumi um, 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 on, on many projects. Bernard Chumi himself collaborated with Derrida um, on a project in Paris. Um, um, and, and so these ideas were in the air when we were trained in the field of architecture, and we were very much fascinated by how spatial organization can change the way in which uh, people can behave uh, in a space and the ways in which people can interact with others and how space can become um, um, a tool, a device uh, for creating a more democratic society. So, um, uh, when I was writing this book, of course, I went back to the literature of the 1990s, and interestingly enough, I found out that a lot of uh, a lot of amazing architects who collaborate with artists, um, such as uh, Reza Danishmir, who actually uh, made a gallery for Feri Dunaav in his Olympic size um, uh, private. Uh, Olympic size uh, swimming pool in his house um, are also fascinated by these theories and they talk about them in their lectures. Um, they have written about these in their um, in their um, writings um, about architecture in Iran. And so I became fascinated in how these architects actually become influenced by these ideas when they implement something in space. And interestingly enough, I also found out that a lot of artists that I discuss in this book actually received their training in the School of Architecture, uh, including, for example, Homayun Sirizi or Katayun Academy. So these people being trained in architecture are very space conscious if you will, and if that is a word that I can use here. Um, so when they think about art, they think about it in terms of its interaction with the space. Um, the, you know, as your as sort of the reader goes through your book, um, there are, you bring in also different, you know, you, right now you've been talking about the theories that influence different artists, but there are also artistic practices or, or artists themselves that have influenced these different artists in Iran. And one of the, you you focus in specifically on um, d dissident or resistant uh, artists in the Soviet bloc um, as being particularly inspirational or particularly influential for some of the artists that you bring up in this book. Um, so I wanted to ask you about that because, you know, it's interesting for me writing on the politics of the state as it relates to certain kinds of, um, artists, particularly filmmakers, I found that the state was also looking to the Soviets for a particular uh, period of time. Um, uh, although, obviously, they're looking to the Soviet sort of political structure, whereas the folks that you're talking about are looking to the dissidents within the Soviet bloc. Um, so if you could sort of, um, and, and I know that you have mentioned and, and written about and talked about how um, 
you know, especially in regards to how artists deal with the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance in Iran, there's so many parallels to the ways in which artists and in, in other ideologically driven revolutionary societies, but especially the Soviet one, sort of had to contend with similar kinds of parallel institutions and came up with their own ways of uh, sort of maybe creating alternative worlds. Um, so, and, and there's one in particular that you mentioned quite a bit, which is, I hope I'm saying his name right, Gertowski um, in theater, who I love. I didn't know, but had this really interesting history with Iran where he was there during the Shiraz Arts Festival. And then he, he comes back into um, sort of the, the art scene in many ways in the post-revolutionary period. So I also love how some of the folks that you follow go beyond the divide of Iran into pre and post-revolutionary and kind of show us something deeper that's going on here. So if you could talk a little bit about the, the parallels that you see and you draw out with the Soviets. Absolutely. Um, you know, Nargis, when you, when you write an art history book, um, you're always uh, obliged, at least my training has, has, uh, has told me so, you're obliged to place the story that you want to tell to your sophisticated readers in a segment of the art history of the world. So in what ways does this book sit within certain art historical movements that have happened around the world? First and foremost, I looked at the alternative art scenes that were generated in places not like New York and London during the 1960s, and especially in the United States with the countercultural movement and the feminist movement. And so I talk a little bit about that. Uh, but then um, I also uh, became fascinated uh, the more I delved into the parallel situations where I found throughout the world, the more I became aware that this is by no means similar to the alternative art scenes of New York City. Because in New York City, if you look at alternative art scenes that were created by feminist artists, they were very visible. They, they usually occupied the storefronts because they wanted to become a very loud voice out there. In Iran, as uh, one of my colleagues uh, always tells me, um, Elham Puri Amer, who's a, who's a very good curator herself, she says, you know, you really need to kind of find your way into the galleries they're kind of hidden you can't they're not just right there on the street in the storefront you don't see them often you have to find your way uh, uh, into like these little narrow alleys or go down uh, or go up uh, in some apartment complex to find a gallery space um and so that led me to think about um uh, you know the um um uh, the oppositional voices within the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Um, these forms of art, to be honest with you, have not been uh, translated into English, or if they have, it's been very recent um, in the past 10 years or so that we've seen a body of work translated about oppositional artistic movements or underground artistic movements in the former Czechoslovakia or in Hungary uh, or in um, or in Poland. And so um, this is not like this is the canon of art history. So likewise, Iranians are not necessarily familiar with these art forms. Um, uh, what so uh, what I found interesting is that despite the fact that they're not directly familiar with what what went on in the artistic scenes of these countries they're all there are parallels so i even like interviewed um an artist group who um presented their works in a dilapidated building in the 1980s in the soviet union and i interviewed them moscow-based artists and i learned a lot from their experience of dealing with the kgb and the ways in which uh, Iranian artists actually deal with uh, the Ministry of Islamic Guidance. So there are a lot of parallels. Eastern European uh, and Soviet film, however, has a different story. So does theater. 
um in theater and in film i realized that artists and filmmakers are more familiar with these genres within the former soviet union and the eastern bloc in particular in theater jerzy grotowski is a larger than life figure we have a book grotowski in iran written by masoud najafi ardabili he is an amazing theater expert who actually lives in poland and I had the privilege of talking to him about the influence of Grotowski, and I'm very grateful to him. He actually opened my eyes to a lot of issues that are going on in the world of theater in Iran, and that's why Iranian theater is so interesting. So the experimental theater that was created by Jerzy Grotowski was introduced during the Shiraz Festival of the Arts when he occupied unconventional spaces like uh, the Palace of Del Gosha in Shiraz. And he had his, um, uh, his uh, performers moving in and out of the spaces of this palace as the audience was sitting down there in a the courtyard watching them. Um, and so um, choosing these non-conventional spaces as opposed to the official theater stage is something uh, that is rooted in these practices that go back even before the Islamic Revolution, and uh, for, for, for obvious reasons, it became extremely helpful as a stylistic preference after the Islamic Revolution. So theater performers had no problem whatsoever performing their works in dilapidated buildings, in unconventional uh, spaces. There's even a genre in Iranian uh, theater called uh, Teatra Apartamani, or apartment theater, uh, that is prominent in Iran. And uh, so um, in every field, I should say that the influences uh, vary depending on uh, uh, which, which, which uh, genre of art production we're talking about. Of course, there are differences, and I've tried my best to open up uh, this scenario in my book. Um, you know, I must say, as, as a non-theater expert, but as someone who went to a lot of theater in Iran over the years, um, especially a lot of the ones that you've covered in here, what I loved is that you you captured both the excitement of those spaces as well as like what those spaces are doing in in these settings in Iran. And um, and it's you know you you also have a section in your book where you talk about the importance of feeling it's something that you know within anthropology they love we love to talk about affect but i, I love how you went into it here and how you know from within propaganda which is what i studied to to beyond to artistic practices that are non-propaganda feeling is of the utmost importance right like you you get into people's feelings and that's that's what moves people um, and the way that you were able to sort of capture that in the theater spaces, I thought was really well done. Um, the, I wanted to, you, you, you talk in this book about decolonizing quite a bit, decolonizing art history. And I know that this is something that in all of our fields we're dealing with at the moment. Um, and you uh, do it in one way that I saw and I sort of drew my attention, which was that you, um, you put in the concepts that you talk about, you also put them in Farsi, you put them in Persian, but you put them in the English, the, well, the Latin scripts of Persian. Um, so I wanted to talk about how you conceptualize decolonization here, how you're using language. Um, and then maybe after that sort of, because um, this has always, been a conundrum for me in thinking about Iran is how can we think about decolonization and decolonizing these spaces where so much of the theory and the things that Iranians are picking up on are actually coming from the West itself are not necessarily decolonial. So, you know, how um, that, that we can get into that in the second half. I first want to sort of focus in on what you were doing here and 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 how you're thinking about decolonization, both in this book and in your work more broadly. Absolutely, Nargis, as you know, decolonization has become a fad. It has become a thing among uh, uh, a lot of um, um, scholars in, in various disciplines from art history to anthropology and whatnot. Um, what I find problematic sometimes with um, some of these um, discussions surrounding 
decolonization is that it's simply assumed that by talking about the art of the other, uh, we, we are decolonizing them. But that is not, in my mind, a, a, a good approach because um, these countries, these people who go out of their way, who put their life on the line to produce art, there is definitely something unique going on in there right that is more than just wanting to present a nude figure in a gallery it's about how they produce theory how they produce new concepts and ideas within the art world and unfortunately most of the time we don't pay attention to that so it was very very important for me to see how um how um, Iranian artists actually translate some, the gen some of the generic kind of mainstream art historical terms in their works, and also how they come up, they themselves come up with theoretical frameworks, ideas, and words that don't have any equivalence in the English language. So that's why for each art historical term that I have produced in this book, I have also included its Finglish form, which is the Farsi term written in Latin letters, because I want the readers of my book to know that these words mean something to Iranian. And if necessary, I have gotten to the depth of what the word actually means. And does it really equal like protest art? Does the right to the city really equal the right to the city that we understand here in the West, or is it something else in Iran, in Iran? And in those cases, I have opened up the meaning of the words, the different connotations of these words, and what they mean to Iranians. And I think it's very, very important for us that if we truly and honestly want to decolonize art history, it's very important for us to get out of our comfort zones and try to learn these words in other languages to see what they mean and what kind of connotations they have within that culture. So um, I, I want to move into this contemporary moment right now because Absolutely. we don't have much time left. And I, I, you have written so brilliantly about a lot of the art that has come out of this um, uprising that's currently happening in Iran. You have, for those who are watching, um, please go look up and we'll put the link in the in the tab as well in the youtube tab um but um pamela academy has an article in uh, hyperallergic about the context of a lot of the um quite amazing uh art protest art and other art that's coming out of the um hashtag masa amini uprisings um over the past six seven weeks in iran um your book provides the historical context over for us to understand where um, you know how once the internet was shut down in iran in these current uprisings it's almost as if it kind of didn't matter that the internet was shut down because the movement continued through the visual through the visual language that artists were putting out right so even though we were not for a while seeing as many and still continue to see very spotty uh video that comes out uh, yet for the first few weeks of this uprising, the constant um, graphic art, the animation, the videos that were coming out were continuing this movement in a very visual way. Uh, it was quite incredible. So many of them are artists who have been uh, raised in Iran, who throughout, for different reasons throughout the past few years, have been forced into exile or are abroad, some of whom are staying in Iran and have also produced this work and put it out there. So can you sort of lay that context or lay the scene for us and give us the context to understand what has been going on? Absolutely. Um, so now just when, uh, you know, this, this movement is phenomenal when it comes to art production. And we have seen um, not only the production of arts uh, that are now, uh, you know, un under, under um, 
the name of anonymous artists, the art forms that are being produced on the streets of Tehran and other cities are done by anonymous artists because a lot of artists are protesting now. They're not going to the universities. They're not performing in official um, art venues because of what's happening to their sisters and brothers that are being arrested or being interrogated by the police. And so they're protesting and they're producing instead a lot of art. A lot of it is being produced on their anonymous artist, uh, uh, but also a lot of it is being produced uh, by some brave artists who live in Iran and are being produced uh, on the space of social media, and especially Instagram, which has a lot of followers. And Iranians are absolutely creative in terms of their usage of Instagram, unlike many other cultures. Um, and so art is playing a very important role in this recent movement uh, and all kinds of art from music to graphic art and illustration art, which is more useful uh, for the format um, uh, uh, that we have um, on Instagram, but also installation artists, performers are, are very active on the ground in different cities and also graffiti artists, um, to name a few. Um, what's this striking to me? with regard to the art production in the recent movement is that unlike the art that I've discussed in this book, it's not oblique, it's not tacit, it's not, um, it's not shy about its protest message, about its dissident identity. It's very much in your face and it's telling you that I am not satisfied with the current revol with the current situation. Uh, so a lot of it is just very bold and straightforward. It seems like a new trend uh, is happening in Iran where artists who have for many decades, for four decades, have tried to improvise and negotiate their way and even kind of show a little bit of understanding to what the regime wants are now breaking that boundary and are saying, no, we are tired and we're not going to do it in the same fashion and we're going to be very, very straightforward. The article that I published in Hyperallergic was mostly because of uh, what I saw was being produced uh, by other journalists, many of them Americans, about the art that is being produced in uh, recent months in Iran. And I thought that their approach uh, was a little bit on the simplistic side because they didn't consider the fact that these artists are actually standing on the shoulders of many, many other artists who have really sacrificed in the past 40 years to keep the art going, highest quality of art going uh, against all odds. So that's why I try to communicate that uh, while we have this straightforwardness in the recent uh, art that is being produced, recent protest art and political art that is being produced in Iran, there have been other techniques that have been used by other artists, including, for example, the spatial camouflage. And I've brought in examples of works by Katarina Karami or, um, uh, or, um, or a few other artists, Puya Ariyampur, uh, to note um, another one. Um, and so uh, I think that it's necessary for people to understand uh, the the art world of Iran in its entirety, as opposed to just focusing on the art that is being produced in the past month. Um, also fascinating along the same line, I find the role of art in the recent movement, and I keep thinking about other revolutions, other movements in which art has played an important role. Uh, of course, we know that in conventional revolutions like the French Revolution, uh, David, for example, Jacques Louis David was the great uh, painter of the revolution. But more interestingly, I find the role of Václav Havel um, in former Czechoslovakia, because Václav Havel himself comes from an artistic background. He was a playwright and a lot of artistic ideas come to the surface during um, the liberation of Czechoslovakia from the former Soviet Union um, uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And I find these parallel, m parallels more fascinating. And so uh, these days, I'm actually reading a lot about Havel. <laughs> um, 
Well, after this, we have to have more of a conversation too, because um, with a few of my colleagues, one who's actually on watching you now, because she just asked a question, um, Annie Kin Moss, um, who is an art historian of the early Soviet period, um, along with Nina Spadhaidi, we've been working on um, different groups in the revolutionary period in Iran and comparing them and thinking about them with the Soviets, as well as other revolutionary art movements that happened. Um, so it, it is really interesting to sort of to, to see all of this in a comparative fashion. Um, but I wanted to, to stick on the current moment for a second before we run out of time. And, you know, the everything that you just explained about this, uh, the art that's coming out today as, as being much more overt, much more uh, political, um, and I wanted to ask you to relate that to um, the um, the reaction of artists in the artistic community to um, Raisi's uh, Minister of Culture and Islamic Guidance. And when he put out the Barnome and, and folks just saying, "We well, then we just won't get our permission from you anymore. We don't care about your permission anymore. And in general, this entire movement and sort of the and thinking even about Raisi's election himself, folks just not voting. And so there's this wider trend of, you know what, we've tried and we've tried and we've tried, but now we just refuse to comply. Like you are not meeting us and, and we refuse to meet you anymore where you are because you've just gone too far down the line. And we're refusing to comply any longer with what you demand. And that this art now is, is um, you know, I mean, for example, like Nick Yusufi's uh, the, um, short video, short film that he ended up in prison for was so incredibly militant. Um, and the fact that he published it on his own Instagram accounts, the fact that, you know, for me, what's been really interesting is that a lot of some of the art that I've been witnessing that is coming out on Instagram in Iran from Iranian artists that they're publishing it on their own accounts. And they're, they're saying that, that they're the ones who made it and they're making very militant forms of art. Um, and so, you know, how do you see this current moment in relation to a year ago with artists saying to the Ministry of Cultural Affairs, we just, we were not going to come for you to permission anymore. You know, how is this an extension of that? Well, of course, uh, you know, while, while they said that we're not going to come to ask you for your permission, um, I think that, um, a lot of them still had to do that. They were obligated to do that uh, because of the scale of their artistic projects. Uh, you know, something that is so larger than life and that is so basically um, uh, scale wise is so uh, monumental. It cannot be done in hidden spaces. But of course, uh, there's a lot that have been also produced uh, without getting permission and they have been presented uh, in galleries uh, that have opened their exhibitions to limited audiences only and so on and so forth. But also from August 21 to now, there hasn't been enough time to kind of see what's happening because sometimes, as you know, art um, takes a while to materialize. It's not like, you know, you just wake up and you make an art the day after. Sometimes it takes like a couple of years to plan these artistic projects and also uh, to get um, a, a space uh, because galleries are also booked up. Um, and so I, I, I haven't very closely followed what's happening since August of 2021, uh, but that itself uh, actually requires a little bit of historical look and investigation. Great. Um, there is one question that I wanted to pose to you from the audience, um, actually from um, Professor um, Annie Kinmas. She wanted to know what year was uh, Grotowski's visit to the Shiraz Festival, if you know. Okay. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember the very first time, but he did participate in several of them, I believe, and then I could be wrong because this is recorded. I want people to uh, oh, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> book or to Masoud Najafi Ardabili's book on Grotowski in Iran. I believe the first one was in 1972, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I was just actually trying to look for it myself, but I can't find it right now in your introduction. Um, Great, thank you. I cannot recommend this book enough to everyone. I'm sorry our hour is over because I want to keep talking because I want to get into the, see, there's so much in this book. I want to like get into the middle parts of it and, and, and talk about it with you. But um, I 
really enjoyed reading through this book and I really recommend it to anyone who, um, you know, I'm not an art historian, but for me, this felt like very anthropological in many ways. It, it, it as you're saying, it, it opens you up to various kinds of movements that have been happening in the art worlds in Iran that are very diverse and that have a lot going on. Um, and I can only imagine the amount of time that it took to research this book and to put it together. So I thank you for the gift that is this book that you gave to all of us. Um, and that um, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you, Pamela, and I wish you the best of luck with the book and all of your other work. Thank you so much, Nargis. I really appreciate